What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLP-FM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archive at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in. This is Madness Radio, and you're, I'm your host, Will Hall. And today we have Jeffrey Goins. Jeffrey is a longtime organizer with the Icarus Project, which is a peer radical mental health support network. He's a software architect and a doctoral student in philosophy. And we're going to be talking about technology and mad science today. So thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio. Uh, Jeffrey. Will, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, we were talking before. There's, there's, um, I'm really interested in this whole question of technology and uh, madness, but it's like a huge, huge topic. And I know that you've got experience as a programmer and software um, architect, that you're also um, a student of, student of communications and uh, philosophy. And you've also been involved in the open source movement. We're going to be talking about that and how that fits in to uh, madness and the mad pride movement. But um, I fu- wanted to start out by just asking you about your own experiences with madness and maybe how you first um, got involved in the mental health system. Sure thing. Um, I guess my experiences in madness date all the way back to my childhood and earlier. Um, my my mother had a brother and sister who both committed suicide, and um, my father actually had a his father had been depressed for a while. Um, growing up, uh, my dad got uh, got real depressed and disappeared for for about three years uh, into a into a slumber. And um, um, they had him on a, a really really nasty cocktail of uh, of medications that uh, pretty much took him away from me for for a long time. Wow, so this really was affecting your family pretty seriously. Well, strangely enough, though, uh, growing up, I actually uh, never even heard the term um, bipolar or manic depressive. Uh, my father always described uh, his situation as a thyroid condition. Oh, wow, so that was kind of the stigma. They were sort of trying to avoid the stigma of it, do you think? Or I think, I think they stayed you know, pretty, pretty clear of it. Um, I, I later uh, learned that uh, he actually... Um, uh, was was uh, thrown into an institution by his mother for a year after high school and and uh, and received electroshock therapy and uh, uh, was really really brutalized and manhandled by the system himself. Yeah, we have that in, in common. My dad was also in the in the system and treated really badly and um, electroshock and all, and all that. So maybe they were probably about the same the same era, the fifties, um, early sixties, I guess. Yeah, when they when they when they locked him up, it was it was you know a year minimum or so back then, and you know I guess uh, uh, my story sort of picks up uh, freshman year of college. Um, I had a I had a pretty rough uh, a pretty rough fall, um, or I was pretty down, but uh, but I did bounce back. Um, I have a remarkable psychological immune system that uh, manages to often transform uh, trauma and pain into. Uh, giddiness and euphoria on occasion and um yeah spring semester is when uh things things really started to get out of hand so was that the stress of starting schools as, as a freshman do you think that was what started to get you um out of control do you think uh well there's 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 always a woman in the middle of it <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that's my experience um and uh um i was lonely i was lonely distraught confused um unsure of my future and uh um i also have experienced uh, uh, the fact that you know when when uh, when I'm not in the right place doing the right thing, then uh, um, uh, the the universe nudges me in a, in a better direction. Right. So you had some um, kind of relationship, and then the stress, and then difficulty, and then you started to go into some sort of madness or some kind of mental health crisis. Yeah, I slipped into into a bit of a crisis. Um, you know, there was uh, you know I was completely unfamiliar with. Uh, with any of the uh, uh, descriptive ways of un- understanding what I was going through, I felt, you know, looking back, I was I was horribly unequipped to uh, to to check any of um, uh, the the spirals that that I was slipping into, and you know, it was really um, I, I I ended up really uh, exacerbating um, the the crisis that I was in by by reinforcing many of the um, 
of the of the bad behaviors that uh, that 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 crisis led to. What was going on? What kind of what kind of crisis were you in? You know, I was. Uh, I guess I was really uh, uh, trying to recapture um, a lost time in my in my teenage years, and and was was basically just acting out. Um, you know, I guess uh, there's that there's that old joke. You know, what's the difference between uh, being precocious and and being manic? And, you know that one. And no, and then the answer is. Yeah, the answer is about eight years. Right. So you were um, you were in a pretty wild state. It sounds like. I was in a pretty wild state. Although I hear nowadays the difference is 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 be whittled away to about two or or three years tops. <laughs> uh, but in any case, um, so so I was I was uh, um, pretty wild and 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 acting out and um, um, just just really running running around all over campus and uh like and not no, sleeping no one really and talking a mile a minute and getting into arguments acting weird talking pretty fast being somewhat confrontational um you know uh, maybe uh putting cigarettes out in the palm of my hand and taking up skateboarding and and really um uh really just uh just trying to try i don't even know what i was trying to do but um but it was a dramatic uh, shift from your previous personality and it started to get people around you worried or concerned or frightened People people became concerned and frightened, and unfortunately, that you know fed back and exacerbated uh, my own anxiety, and and uh, and really uh, really led to to a much more dangerous state of affairs. Um, and and that first time through, um, I had a lot to learn about uh, about the various uh, states of of consciousness and awareness that uh, that I was about to journey through. But um, but I was not receiving help on on any front. I was uh, being treated as a as a disciplinary. Um, uh, case and and uh, people were interested in in punishing and controlling me as opposed to uh, being compassionate and understanding. That's actually a, th- a thread that comes through a lot of people's stories is that they start to go into some kind of expanded state and it actually feels positive in a lot of ways, but they encounter around them the fear of other people who are concerned or maybe unfamiliar with the person or maybe can't communicate in the way that they're used to. And then there's kind of this feedback loop that happens that suddenly the person is in this world where people are afraid of them. They start to feel the fear and then that changes it. Then they act differently and then people get more afraid. And then pretty soon you're in this, um, you're in this spiral. Is that kind of how it went? Oh yeah. I'd even go further and say in some cases, uh, there was, there was some jealousy at at the amount of, uh, of, of happiness and, and bliss that, that I seem to, to manage to capture. And, uh, and I mean, you're dead on that. You know, once once the the fear, the anxiety, and the concern ends up being being expressed and directed um, my way, then uh, the response is is, uh, is is reflexive and and really really uh, uh, gets caught up and transforms the entire experience into something uh, a lot a lot less friendly. So you said you were happy and people were kind of jealous. Of you. Were you having at this point some kind of spiritual side to what you were going through? Were you having any kind of insights or experiencing? psychic phenomenon or dreaming or anything like that uh for sure although it wasn't until uh a year or two later that i that i really began to uh do do the research and the work to really contextualize and and understand uh better in uh, in spiritual terms what what i was experiencing um but at the time you know and this was this was about 18 so um it was just uh just incredible energy um incredible incredible wisdom um and interestingly, and this this threw everybody off. I was I was still maintaining a full course load, uh, doing doing great in all of my classes, and and nobody could completely figure out how I was managing uh, to do everything that I was. But um, but I was keeping it together. Uh, one one classical diagnosis that that never that never really fit me um, is the fact that uh, I'm I'm actually usually able to keep up with my racing thoughts, and um, it's not the case that. Uh, that the thoughts get ahead of me, um, but rather I keep up with them and and lose most of the rest of society around me. Right. So that's kind of the difference between a superpower and just like breakdown, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, um, it, it's learning to to harness, rec- recognize, harness, and control uh, those those powers that uh, that ha- have you know has been an ongoing challenge, which uh, which uh, uh, various tools that and 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 very ancient you know theoretical systems that that i have encountered along the way have have helped me a great deal with um but but you know to be sure um you know just like uh, like any power i mean these uh these forces can can bend towards towards good or evil you know <laughs> capital g and e so uh so 
first time through was uh, was uh, was quite a rush. Um, thanks Spider-Man and Superman on their first jumps. <laughs> so you tapped into these forces, and what what happened? How did you end up? Did, were you hospitalized, or did you get into conflict with the authorities on campus, or with your family, or how did it go? Right. So so I ended up uh, you know taking some time off. Uh, you know, the university was actually. Uh, uh, in the end, once I, I I got to the right people and they recognized that they were they were somewhat understanding. Although uh, once it was time for me to take some time off, I was right back into the hornet's nest of uh, of my family situation, which was, at the time was extremely dysfunctional and um, and really 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 quite problematic. Um, and and returning there was 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 the worst place on the planet. I think I could have I could have gone. Um, and at that point, I mean, there was a, you know a series of uh, of circumstances and events, but um, I basically got 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 duped into uh, into going to see a psychiatrist. Uh, my father's psychiatrist, actually. Who, oh wow, who, your father's uh, psychiatrist. Wow. My father's psychiatrist. So so uh, so time to bring out uh, uh, Freud in in all of his uh, uh, neurotic glory. Um, and and this man um, was was not prepared to. Uh, to let me to let me leave that night, though I didn't know it, and uh, I distinctly remember being in in his office and uh, you know having full intention, uh, you know, to I had tickets to a concert and I really needed to, you know, get get out of the house and let off some steam and and he was he was not he was not gonna let me gonna let me go that night and um, when I when I started to sense the the uh, the control um, in his in his voice, you know, I tried to get out of there, but uh, in the direction that I ran. You know the doors were locked, and you know they were glass, but but I still I still I still lay down in peace as like I saw these hulking um, orderlies coming my way, and you know despite the fact that I had innocently surrendered, they basically uh, uh, manhandled me, you know, to the emergency room, and you know I was uh, uh, you know at the at the at the at the point of a knife, basically, um, uh, you know, told to sign in unless uh, uh, or else I'd be involuntarily committed. So. Yeah, the famous uh, voluntary involuntary. They do that in a lot of places. <laughs> so you're forced. Yeah, well, you're forced I, even to be at the voluntary. time, I had I had the senses to recognize that um, that I'd be better off if I was voluntary. Um, and and that first that first introduction to to the system was uh, was really really horrific. Um, you know, it was it was a page right out of uh, out of uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. There was a nurse ratchet down the hall, and I mean, my my situation is. Uh, Exacerbated by the fact that uh, uh, my baseline personality um, overlaps significantly with uh, uh, a lot of classical diagnostic criteria, so um, I've always been, you know, by nature, um, high energy and uh, um, inquisitive, and and uh, I mean, you know, I had a, a whole set of synonyms um, that you know were the positive take on many of the uh, uh, negative portrayals that uh, that that show up in in books like the DSM. Um, but honestly, weeks later, fast forwarding ahead, and, and then we'll come back. I mean, nobody nobody could believe that uh, um, that I was down when uh, when everyone around me recognized me for for who I was. You know. So you had these. Um, so your sort of ordinary personality got pathologized, and um, you had all these qualities like speediness and intelligence and creativity and racing thoughts and things. And the doctors kind of saw those as, oh, he's still in a manic phase, but then people in your life said, actually, no, this is kind of how, how Jeffrey is. Yeah, they really held those against me. Um, they held my, my basic personality traits. They held those up as, uh, as, as deviant and, uh, and pathological. And, um, you know, my experiences in, in, in that institution, um, uh, really scarred me. Uh, I was, I was, uh, I was regularly, um, thrown into, into, into the quiet room. I, I remember working out, uh, you know, uh, Fun, fun, fun games like uh, managing to uh, have the self-control to take my uh, to take my antipsychotics orally, and then you know quickly drinking six cups of water. You know, <laughs> and next thing they knew, two hours later, I'd be doing push-ups in the in the quiet room, and they they had no idea how I was managing to pull it off. It was uh, uh, it was it was quite a scary place. Um, um, eventually, I ended up on a one-on-one -on -one observation and pretty much uh, confined to my room for a couple of weeks straight. Um, uh, I went to court, um, and it was, you know, kind of, uh, kind of complicated in terms of my, you know, psychodrama playing out with my parents testifying for me and against me. You know, my mom and dad split over whether or not I, uh, I deserved to be there, sort of as a, 
as a as a way of uh, uh, kind of not beating me into shape, but yeah, beating me into shape. Um, so and there was kind of a tug of war between your parents around what to do with you. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, the the hospitalization was really uh, uh, was really this this instrument um, in in uh, in a in a power struggle that uh, that was playing out. You know, with my life. So um, I can recognize that now, but at the time it was uh, it was it was it was quite an ordeal. And so you were not suicidal or dangerous or or threatening anybody. It sounds like. No, not at all. And um, you know, I mean, one of the uh, the points I was I was hoping to talk about a little today is uh, the idea that um, well, first off, in in uh, in my history, I've actually never um, been hospitalized for depression, and I've never attempted suicide, um, not once. Um, my encounters with the with the system have usually uh, been for what um, I've been uh, misdiagnosed with as uh, as mania, and um, um, I've often been uh, locked up purportedly because I was a threat to myself or to others, um, but then kept against my will um, because I was manic. And that little sleight of hand whereby uh, people are not kept in, in, in these institutions because they continue to be a threat to themselves or to others, but rather because they don't conform to uh, normal modes of behavior is, uh, is, is really, really dangerous, uh, in my opinion. Um, you know, in, these, in these situations, I've, I've gotten doctors to full out admit that I was not a threat to myself to, or to others, and yet been kept against my will for for days or weeks after that. Yeah, the power that they have is really arbitrary, and the legal protections are very limited. And even, of course, you know, the diagnostic or or view of patients as dangerous or suicidal is itself very very subjective, and it's often used just as a power thing, or it's just how the um, how the doctors want to deal with people, or what's convenient for them, or the insurance situation. Or, like you said, they've got somebody who they see as psychotic or different or not behaving the way that they want them to, and then they just say, okay, we got to keep this person in here until we get the right medications in them, and they start changing, and they start to do what we want them to do. No doubt, and not to over-dramatize this, but, uh, but we really got a situation here that uh, is beginning to resemble Guantanamo. Um, you know, there's a, a, a complete suspension of of habeas corpus and due process. It's really, uh, it's nowadays the case, and it's gotten way worse over the years, um, where, you know, at the slightest suggestion of mischief, um, you know, police officers at their discretion will take you to an emergency room, and then, you know, one psychiatrist with a wink to another, and the next thing you know, you're effectively incarcerated um, arbitrarily without without any appeal process. And then the um, the process of, of forcing people and then giving them medication, forcing them to take medication and observing them, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to change their minds, change their behavior um, using a kind of punishment. It's experienced as punishment by a lot of people. And that scenario starts to look like torture from a definition of the way we understand torture as being the application of force to get someone to comply with someone's um, someone's thinking or someone's behavior or to change their behavior or belief or, or thinking and using punishment and inflicting suffering on them to do that. So it's, it's very similar to a torture situation. Torture, and, you know, again, I mean, we're talking medieval here in the sense that the crimes are thought crimes. I mean, it's not necessarily even uh, uh, crimes on the books. It's uh, uh, the crimes have to do with beliefs and opinions. And, um, you know, you, you need you need look no further than uh, Naomi Wolf's recent analysis of uh, the slippery slope to totalitarianism, and you know we can understand that every totalitarian society has had an easy way to lock up and oppress the dissidents. Right, psychiatry being very closely linked to totalitarianism throughout history. Well, um, so you mentioned a few of the things that happened to you when you were in the hospital, like the um, being in the um. Uh, the isolation room. What were some of the other experiences that you said? You said it was a pretty horrible time when you've been when you've been locked up. Well, needing needing to justify my personality uh, was problematic. Um, uh, at the same time, I also uh, you know at, uh, was very was very interested in uh, uh, in science and uh, was very frustrated at the lack of of, of answers um, that that I was being given. And truthfully, um, you know, these early experiences were were part of what led me back to philosophy. Um, First, I, I turned to psychology for, for some answers and, and quickly realized that uh, many psychologists were, were not even asking the right questions. And uh, the, the level of uh, explanation that I was demanding 
from my practitioners just just wasn't and still is not available. So how did you end up getting out of the hospital? <laughs> well, uh, eventually, uh, the situation there was was so dramatic that I transferred to a, a much cushier facility, um, facility that, uh, that that no longer exists, but uh, it was much more about uh, 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 upper class um, upper class children being punished by their parents for experimenting with uh, drugs and alcohol. And um, uh, we had a, a trip to the movies uh, after which, uh, or upon which, I uh, I remember eloping. So. Um, my very first experience with hospitalization ended up with uh, with a great escape. So you escaped from a mental hospital. <laughs> they call me the Joker, Will. <laughs> did the um, did the skies fall? I mean, did you just sort of descend into madness and you were back in the hospital in a few weeks, or how, what happened when you when you escaped? Well, after I escaped, I uh, I decided to to start spreading this to the rest of society. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you are like the Joker, I see. Uh, no, I was. Uh, I remember escaping, and uh, I was very careful to to be attentive to to the rules of the game. And by that point, I was back on voluntary status, which meant that um, nobody had to go looking for me, and they only had a couple of days. And you know, I called home, and my parents were uh, were were quite upset but um but i was not compromising and uh uh well they had a choice as to ever seeing me again or uh or taking me back under those circumstances so uh no i didn't i didn't go back that time and uh you know i returned to school um you know the next semester and uh uh you know went went merrily on my way until uh until the spirits decided to revisit um my uh my my body and and uh we we took it from there so it sounds like this is something that you're still kind of struggling with, and um, every now and then you still have these spirits moving into your body or these huge energy experiences, or you go into these, these altered states. Well, practice. Practice, I say, is, uh, is one of the only ways to, <laughs> to really get a handle. So you're going to keep doing it until you get it right, it sounds like. <laughs> I'm getting much better at it. Um, no, I remember uh, genuinely struggling to try to uh, isolate and discern the variables in my life that uh, that were leading to these crises, and um, um, they're beginning to to be a lot more uh, predictable and understandable to me. Um, I'm much more sensitive to uh, to situations like this uh, coming on in the first place, and and you know, with a turn um, to to ancient philosophy, uh, from Eastern philosophy to mysticism, I've also learned that at some point there's uh, there's no no choice but to begin to work on, on one's character so that uh, a lot of the uh, behavioral dispositions that people return to are, are naturally more benign. Well, what kinds of, uh, that's very interesting, the, the direction that you've taken this in terms of studying philosophy and studying mysticism, but I'm curious, what kinds of things are you now more sensitive to being aware of so that you kind of know when one, when one of these kind of crisis periods starts to, to, to approach? Well, um, you know, I, I have a, a great support network. Um, that's one of the uh, uh, areas that that peer support groups like Icarus can 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 help with. But but ultimately, uh, I think it's still the case that a lot of these responsibilities, you know, fall, fall directly on on an individual. Um, I've developed uh, many coping techniques, um, including uh, the you know conscious and willful uh, manifestation of what I call anti symptoms. So you know, as I feel. Um, sort of these heightened states approaching, which are are, are pretty pretty easy to, to notice, especially uh, you know if uh, if I begin to lose sleep or or begin to um, um, uh, enter enter realms of uh, of, uh, of higher ideas. Um, um, I, I take a I take I take a pause, uh, you know, try to try to return to the center of my breathing and and my thoughts, and 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 literally try to uh, adjust my behavior in ways I know. Are um, opposite of, uh, of of the behavioral descriptions that uh, characterize madness in our society. So you're someone who's very vigilant of their own consciousness, and you're sort of have developed different sorts of techniques that allow you to manage yourself when you start to feel like you're drifting away or going into some state. Well, I try. I do try, and um, you know, to, to to come back to um, you know the the deficiencies of, of modern psychology. I mean. One one challenge with uh, a book like the DSM is that it's really firmly rooted in in behaviorism. Um, 
you know, the behaviorism of, uh, of the 1920s is, uh, pretty much uh, denies the existence of, of any internal state and attempts to uh, uh, understand and describe human behavior based on, on, nothing, but, on nothing but behavior. Um, and you know, from that perspective, um, if you are acting crazy, then by definition you are crazy, and if you are not, then uh, uh, it's much tougher to get, uh, to get pinned for it, although <laughs> you'd be amazed at, uh, at, uh, at how desperately they'll try. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that's always been curious to me is that when you're in a hospital, you know, one of the ways that you can get out is you just start acting normal, you just start faking it, and they seem to reward that and, and like that, and a lot of people just learn that there's this kind of shuffle, this game that you have to play um, with hospital authorities so you can kind of get out of there by just acting the way that they want to, regardless of what your inner state is. They don't seem to care about what's going on inside of you at all, as long as you're not complaining about it, as long as you're talking to people um, in a certain kind of way, and as long as you're behaving from the outside in a way that's acceptable. For the most part, although... Um... You know, I've also been in situations where they've been hard pressed to uh, to come up with uh, their their Chinese menu of symptoms. And um, you know, between us, I mean, these interstates are um, um, do do vary. And um, and you know, I've I've had heart to hearts with friends who who can notice when uh, when you know I've gone elsewhere um, just by the cadence or the tone of my voice and uh, and the look in my eyes. And um, you know, it's 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 pretty tough. And I think we've uh, we're in a pretty bad place as a society if uh, uh, if the tone of your voice is enough to get you uh, incarcerated against your will. But um, but that's that's those are situations I've been in. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and we're interviewing Jeffrey Goins, who is a longtime organizer with the Icarus Project. He's a survivor of the mental health system, a software architect, and a graduate doctoral student in philosophy. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, the technology aspect because I know that you're a software architect and you're very much involved in the open source movement. But I'm I'm fascinated with what you said about how um, when you're in the hospital, the people around you, the authorities around you, weren't giving you any satisfactory answers, and so you started turning to philosophy and mysticism. Tell us about your research in that and the kind of things that you learned. Um. Yeah, that might be a bit more than than we can fit comfortably into into <laughs> right. the show or this format. But to begin right. with, um, you know, it it rapidly became apparent uh, to me that uh, we would never crack uh, the mystery of uh, of madness uh, until we solve the mind body problem, which is a Gordian knot that uh, has has defied unlocking or untying for uh, for millennium. Um, and so any any uh, gross attempts to to claim uh, any kind of uh, definitive causal account of the relationship between the body and the mind uh, to this day, you know, suffers from 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 the uncertainty and the and the ignorance of uh, of of the depth of of that of that quandary. So ba- break that down for us. So basically, you're saying that Western science really has no idea what the mind is, or how what the connection is, or how the sort of physical um, biological substance of the brain or the nervous system actually gives rise to something that we call thoughts or dreams or experiences or love or fear or any of the things that we all share and we can say okay look yeah we do have these experiences but but western science is kind of clueless to really put it together with what's actually happening under the microscope yes and there have been you know incredible advances in in neuroscience uh, molecular uh, biology uh, neurochemistry and psychology. Um, I noticed I left out psychiatry um, over the past few decades, and and that's undoubtable. But um, but you know, when pressed, I think uh, well, the leaders in those fields will acknowledge that you know when it comes to the to the mystery of the mind and where and how uh, the self, the ego, and consciousness emerge, um, that is still a wide open question. And um, you know, for me, where that leaves us today is uh, the importance of of understanding you know how we can bracket some of those questions. And recognize the the difference between um, you know whatever those answers turn out to be, uh, no matter no matter how we resolve any of those questions, the uh, the step the value judgment of uh, of of labeling any any condition and illness um, is a leap that goes beyond whatever science produces. How did um, religious philosophy and mysticism come in? How did, what did you learn about from that? 
Well, I guess I learned that, um, you know, a lot of people disregard uh, uh, or dismiss, um, you know, ancient, ancient thought and, uh, and mysticism as, at best, poetry nowadays. And um, when, you, when, you, when you get to it up close, I think there's a, a much better understanding that, uh, that the, the geniuses of, of, of those days, and, and, and they had their, their Newtons, Einsteins, and Galileos, um, the geniuses of those days were we're, we're looking to inner, inner experience as, uh, as their source of evidence and, uh, and investigation. And so, um, you know, people were doing empirical work, uh, replicable empirical work against their own experiences and trying to understand, describe, and, uh, and, and control their own experiences. And many of those um, descriptions are, are, are either directly applicable today or applicable uh, whenever. Um, people enter altered states of consciousness that resemble some of the ones that were described in, in many of those old old texts. Now, are we talking about the Old Testament or the Kabbalah, or what are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, the Kabbalah was, uh, was directly uh, uh, concerned with many of these, um, these issues. I mean, there are two major branches of Kabbalah, and, and one has a bit more to do um, with philosophy and theory, and another has a lot more to do with, uh, with inner experience and, and the study of the ecstatic um, in the Western um, traditions, I mean, you know, this falls under the, the broad um, umbrella of the Gnostic or the inner traditions, and um, there has there has actually been uh, a very strong tradition of, of contemplative study and uh, and reflection um, within Western faiths, but uh, but it's it's really been suppressed and and greatly ignored in in, in education and uh, you know and through the predominant power structures that. Uh, that, that, that are interested in, in maintaining control over, over those communities. So see if you can help me here. How are we going to transition this discussion into technology and where the future of computers <laughs> are going? Because I know that's also a really big part of your work and the kind of, of studies that you're doing in your graduate program. Sure. I mean, you know, one way of coming at that is, uh, is to remember uh, and consider the ways in which uh, uh, Technology is a very broad term and doesn't, you know, apply exclusively to to gears and cell phones, but but also describes um, uh, instruments in the external world that have uh, influence and bearing on uh, on on human beings and behaviors. And uh, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, drugs are 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 a technology. I don't think that's uh, particularly controversial. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, the uh, uh, the technologies that uh, uh, all of us are, are experiencing and subjected to in our lives are, are sometimes at odds with uh, uh, the social, cultural, and political um, values that, that we, we hold dear. Are we moving to a surveillance society, and do you think that pharma and um, psychiatric drugs are part of that with the growing diagnosis and the growing you know, using of psychiatric medications to manage people's moods and consciousness and, and minds? Yeah, undoubtedly, and uh, and and maybe a good way to uh, to to come at this is uh, by by taking a close look at um, at the relationship of of you know the free software movement and and the Mad Pride movements, and um, I think a lot of people are surprised at connections there, and uh, and some of those connections have everything in the world to do with uh, the technology of the law, and um, you know there certainly are theorists out there who have you know described the legal system, um, which is made of code. You know, as as very much a similar kind of thing as software code, um, and to the extent that you know legal code, you know, does control uh, human behavior in, in many ways, um, there are uh, a lot of parallels um, to that to that sort of technology as well. Um, and so, I think um, you know the connections are uh, uh, there are some general ones as well as uh, as well as specific ones. But um, but when it comes to um, you know um, free Free software and free culture. I think um, um, what we're really talking about is, um, is 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 a struggle with and against uh, uh, the intellectual property system, the way that things are today. And uh, um, really, you know, on the one hand, we've got a, a situation where uh, the free software and free culture movements are are meta issues, and and by that I mean that if some of those battles go down poorly, uh, they will affect everybody's ability to advocate for anything. Well, when you say the free software movement and and um, uh, free culture movements, what is it that you're talking about? This is related to open source software, is that right? 
Oh, it is. And, um, you know, uh, free software uh, evangelists uh, make, make a point of, of distinguishing between uh, the open source movement and the, and the free software movement. And the operational distinction there has to do with uh, uh, the priorities um, when it comes to what it is that's being valued. And, and free software uh, advocates understand that um, when, it comes to, when it comes to software um, freedom, uh, is a very, very important value. Um, if, if we want to kind of go over uh, some of the history here, I think there are actually some lessons that, uh, that can be teased out of the free software movement that apply to other activist movements as well. Um, you know, the free software movement dates back to the, I think, the late 60s, um, when Richard Stallman, uh, uh, a genius in, in his time, um, was struggling to come to terms with, uh, with, with the notion of software as property. And... Um, recognizing that the political system w would never move fast enough to address this problem in time, uh, figured out a way to hack the legal system. You know, notice uh, <laughs> hacking is something that can be done to legal systems as, and culture as well as, uh, as, well as software code. Um, and what he figured out a way to do was to use the laws of copyright against themselves, <laughs> so to speak. And, uh, and what that was all about was, uh, uh, was a term, you know, copy left. And using the copyright laws, a, copyright, uh, a creator of software, or, or nowadays a creator of any piece of, of uh, any, any cultural product, can decide to, to exercise their copyright laws to make it so that any, uh, any future user of that, of that, um, of, of, of that uh, asset or piece of software um, necessarily uh, will need to change it, or will need to share their changes with, uh, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> um, shifting gears and, and got a little lost in the, in the, in the description. But uh, the essence of copy left is all about uh, allowing uh, or enforcing the idea of sharing. So, now, why, is this so, so why is this so important to our personal freedom and to the implications of living in a more and more surveillance society? I mean, isn't it, I mean, you could argue that just like, well, you know, people who invent stuff, write software or write programs, they should just be able to own it and control it and, and keep it uh, copyrighted. What, what's at stake here from your point of view? Right. Um, a lot of things. Um, I mean, you know, first of all, we can start with uh, uh, the rather bold assertion, uh, I'll attribute this to, to Lawrence Lessig, that uh, uh, text is really becoming the Latin of our time and audio and video the new vernacular. And uh, while that might not be uh, the most accurate description of the state of affairs today, um, I think it's really important to recognize that uh, um, that in a digital era, uh, audio and video are, are, you know, the ability to express yourself through audio and video is a speech right. And uh, we're living in a situation today where uh, to make a movie, you basically need an army of lawyers unless you're in a blank white room. And, you know, when you as an activist organization advocating for anything today are interested in, in, in conveying or expressing your message, um, you're, you're going to come up against a lot of these intellectual property laws, which which have basically been transformed into uh, an instrument of censorship. So um, their original intention, which at all times needed to be brokered against uh, our value of free speech. I mean, copyright, when, when you think about it, is a way of restricting people's speech. And you know, that balance was struck at a particular time with particular considerations in mind. But, um, but you know, in a digital era, every act is a copy. And um, there are far more activities that are uh, being regulated purportedly under intellectual property laws than when those laws were created or envisioned. And so uh, a recognition of the extent to which these laws um, you know, uh, are controlling our activities is, uh, is really crucial here. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would argue that you know, in the 21st century, the battleground for civil and human rights, human rights too, uh, will be fought over, over intellectual property. And um, now one you know, of that, the issues that's a now, one of the issues that you've um, written about and um, maybe applies here was the recent um, releasing of the memos about the dangers of Di Zyprexa that Eli Lilly had suppressed, how those were released to the world um, by hackers who put them out on the Internet, and the courts tried to stop it, and they were able to actually get some injunctions, but basically the documents made it to the media and were spread um, far and wide. So, is that an illustrative kind of um, case for what you're arguing about? Well, that that's actually an incredible story, and and anyone who's not familiar with it really really ought to look it up. Um, this was uh, uh, the Electronic Frontiers' first wiki case, which uh, was notable in its own in its own right. But um, 
if we back up for a moment, I think, uh, I think we'll see actually, you know, many of these themes coming together in this incident. And so it, it's a really nice, uh, a nice little thought experiment for, for unpacking um, the interplay here. And, you know, really part of what's going on, you know, relies on, a, on, a, on an understanding or a model of how pharmaceutical companies are, are making money nowadays. And, um, you know, I think, I think we're living in an era when uh, the pharmaceutical companies are pathologizing the full range of human experience um, and basically inventing new diseases for which they'll sell you the cure. And to understand why they need to do that um, depends or relies also on a decent understanding of intellectual property. Um, you know, these, these drug companies have blockbuster drugs um, that eventually come out of patent. And in order to maintain that pipeline, um, they either need to find new applications for the existing drugs or invent new drugs that can be patented, you know, for a little while until they go generic. But, um, but at the, at, from the get-go, um, it's, it's really essential to understanding the economics of the system to, to, to consider how intellectual property factors into the mix. Because as long um, as the drug is, is patented and they control those rights, that's where they make their money. As soon as it becomes a generic drug, then they need to move on to make, to make their money elsewhere. Right. And what we're witnessing today, you know, with the extension of the antipsychotics, you know, into treating old people with dementia and kids with behavioral disorders um, is precisely an attempt to extend these patents over time and at least stave off temporarily, uh, you know, the, some of these drugs going generic. Um, so it has no medical logic at all, really. It's just an, arc, an economic um, drive to continue to, to squeeze out more profits from this um, private intellectual property that they have until it goes into the public domain. Right. And, you know, I think the corruption that is rampant in this industry right now will become apparent over time. And, uh, you know, the Zyprexa Memos incident really gives us a glimpse, you know, of how some of those uh, uh, incriminating deeds might actually come to light. I mean, you know, that was a case where, uh, uh, what, there was a class action suit going on for, for years over you know, some of, the, some of the side effects of one of these drugs. And, uh, you know, Lily was in the midst of, uh, of attempting to, to cover up any knowledge they had of, of, of these side effects. And, you know, what emerged in, in discovery, um, you know, and there were, you know, a couple of heroes involved in, 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 in liberating these memos in the first place. But what emerged was that, was that the company knowingly downplayed the side effects of these drugs. Not only did they cause obesity, but they caused diabetes. And then they had actively set up an internal marketing campaign, you know, where they were sending out salespeople to doctors and very carefully describing patients that were, you know, outside of the approved usages of these drugs. They had set up internal marketing campaigns to push these drugs on old people with dementia and kids with behavioral disorders. And, uh, you know, these memos, um, you know, clearly indicate that that's exactly what was going on within these companies at the time. And as a result of those memos getting released, now there are many, many states that are suing Eli Lilly for billions of dollars because of Medicare fraud, basically. Isn't that right? Billions of dollars. Um, but, you know, coming back to the, the questions that we were, we were uh, touching on before, um, you know, take a close look at the measures that Lilly took to try to suppress this evidence. Uh, the measures that they, that they resorted to had everything in the world to do uh, with, with intellectual property laws. They were interested in, in claiming that these memos were a trade secret. They tried to invoke uh, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to initially to pull these sites down. They, um, you know, they basically were interested in um, restraining the speech you know, of, of you know, players who were you know, completely unrelated to this court case um, over a, a matter of uh, you know, extreme uh, relevance to, to, to the public health. And, and the, you know, the, the tools that they were using to try to censor um, these citizens were, were all wrapped up in intellectual property. Um, uh, likewise, you know, it, we're, we're also entering an era where uh, people need to think long and hard about the challenges uh, in blowing a whistle uh, in an era of omniscient surveillance. And so uh, Lilly needs to worry a lot about, uh, and all companies are, are beginning to worry a lot about the kinds of records that, that they are keeping over time, which uh, potentially can be used to expose and hold some of these companies accountable, uh, once again, provided that some of the, uh, the legal um, instruments and technologies are set up in ways that, uh, that allow for those, for those facts to come to light. 
And activists also need to be uh, very sensitive and concerned about um, the kinds of digital trails that, that they're leaving behind. So when you say whistleblowing, the, one of the key pieces of the Zyprexa memos case was the fact that there were hackers who were able to get the memos onto some websites, onto some wikis, that anyone could download them, and at the same time it wouldn't be traced back to those hackers. It was done anonymously, and that was really a key part of that, right? Oh, for sure. And I think that uh, if you ask uh, prominent legal scholars uh, about, you know, what can be done in America to preserve to preserve privacy in the future, um, I think a lot of people will tell you that uh, um, having provisions for anonymous speech, and that means the right to speak anonymously or even to litigate anonymously, um, to say things anonymously in society will be will be central to civil rights in the future. Uh, I mean, we are embarking on a uh, uh, a very scary era um, in terms. Well, it's exciting and scary. So. Um, I would say that uh, uh, regardless of how things turn out, um, all bets are off uh, when it comes to uh, uh, individuals' identities over time. Well, I mean, you, used a really, kind of, uh, you used a kind of scary term, um, on omniscient surveillance. And I really I think that that's actually where we're headed because if everything goes digital, that means that everything that you read, everything that you look at, everything that you look at in a digital context, potentially someone is watching and recording it. So suddenly the privacy of your inner thoughts, of your things that you may be interested in, say you're interested in researching some extreme part of human behavior or madness or crime, and you're just curious, just your curiosity has led you to read things or to look at things that are maybe outside of the mainstream, suddenly that is no longer a private affair of your imagination or your curiosity. Suddenly it's something that someone is potentially able to keep a record of that and then use that either to influence you or control you or blackmail you or threaten you or sell a product to you or to evaluate you for a job or to say, well, actually, we don't want this person living in our community or working in our in our corporation, or actually, we do want this person because they have certain kinds of private right. qualities or doing psychological assessments of people. I mean, is this the kind of thing that you're, you're talking about? Undoubtedly. And, you know, I think the... Uh uh, psychiatric survivors or, 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 or participants in the system um, especially need to be vigilant about, about these trends because, you know, we're looking at, uh, at, the, at, the, at the virtual chart, the digital chart, and, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, there are currently incumbents in power who are the ones who are writing the nurses' memos and the doctor's notes, and those are going on your permanent record. Um, there are, you know, facts or <laughs> versions of facts, facts that are framed in, with, in, with particular language that will be following people around for a long time. And, um, um, but really when it comes to uh, uh, the politics of surveillance, we're, we're really just uh, you know, in our infancy uh, as a movement and beginning to, to even contend uh, with these issues in ways that can be synthesized and understood for a lot of people. Um, there's still a lot of people out there who, who think, you know, if I'm not doing anything wrong, then why should I care? And there's so much information out there being gathered and collected that they'll never find it anyway. And, uh, you know, both of those assertions are, are, are really wrong. <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's really important to, uh, to work on explanations that will, will help people understand and care about um, precisely the, the mechanisms that, that you just described. Jeffrey, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to ask you to um, bring it back, bring this discussion of omniscient surveillance and potentially the kind of totalitarian society that we're, we're starting to, to build around ourselves. Bring it back to some of the research that you've done into prophecy and the spiritual insights that you got during your, your times of madness or altered states of consciousness. Like what, what sorts of predictions or insights do you have about the deeper um, implications of this and what's happening and where we're headed? Well, Will, I'll try. Um, you know, one way I've been, <laughs> I've been thinking about uh, describing the era that we're embarking on um, could be thought of as, uh, as the end of forgetting. And, um, you know, bear with me. I'm momentarily uh, conflating records and memory. But when I say the end of forgetting, I think uh, it's obvious to all of us that the amount of records that are being collected and saved are going up exponentially, um, you know, by the day. And uh, uh, what's really interesting to me there is that, the relationship between memory and identity has long been understood by philosophy, psychology, science fiction, you name it. And um, it's usually explored in popular culture through the device of amnesia. So take, for example, 
Vertigo or Memento or Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind. Or uh, Blade Runner, for example. Blade Runner. Yeah, you know, I think we get it. Um, identity and memory have, have, have something to do with each other. And uh, if we're hurtling you know, towards a world in which, uh, in which you know, nobody ever forgets anymore, then uh, the way that I think we need to start looking at things and, and, and looking at things quickly uh, has everything in the world to do with who controls those memories. So maybe more important than the amount of records that are saved is, is who's in control of them. And, and by that I mean, you know, are we building a society in which other people know more about me than I do, you know, other people probably being governments, corporations, and the power elite? Uh, are we building a completely transparent society where everybody can find out as much as they want about everybody else? Or are, can we really quickly figure out how to redirect the flow of information back around the individual? And, uh, and really reclaim or, or, or you know, manage to be able to continue to, to preserve a sense of uh, dignity and privacy you know, in our lives. Jeffrey Goins, um, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Will, thanks so much for having me. I mean, it's always a pleasure to be here, and, uh, and good luck to you in all, in all of your work and undertakings. Thanks a lot. Are there any websites or any contact information you'd like to give people if they're interested in these issues and they want to explore further? Um, well, I encourage everybody to search for uh, Zyprexa Kills, and, uh, and that tag will find, will, will, will lead you to all the information and more on, uh, on that topic and beyond. Uh, the memos are, are widely available and, uh, and, and should be read carefully by everybody. And, uh, and of course, you know, spend some time uh, uh, on the IcarusProject.net, and uh, uh, I suppose if, if you ask around, you just might uh, uh, have a chance to to meet me and uh, maybe some of my cohorts. Thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Jeffrey Goins. You've been listening to an interview with Jeffrey Goins. He's a longtime organizer with the Icarus Project, which is a peer mental health support network. He is a software architect and a graduate doctoral student in philosophy. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilof, and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio to help us get broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.